It used to be a more subtle thing, but I'll bet your viewers have noticed it's almost like there's no longer any pretense of hiding it. It used to be that we sort of self-censored what we put on the news and we used rational judgments as to what would make it on the nightly newscast with all the news that was out there. But slowly but surely, through a process I described partly in my last book, The Smear, a whole industry understood how to pull our strings and get their nose under the tent of news organizations so that they can decide what we do put on TV, what we don't put on TV, also other news sites, and more importantly, how it's shaped, how it's manipulated to try to shape public opinion in a way that you will not hear viewpoints that they've decided are harmful to their interests or, in other words, off narrative. This didn't begin with Donald Trump, yet he gets a lot of the blame from mainstream media about this. He's depicted as a liar, a clown. Joe Biden even said that to his face in a presidential debate, and I know the media didn't challenge him on that. And now with questionable election results, allegations of fraud, it seems the media is trying to force Trump to concede. It was just the opposite, as you remember, in 2000, when Al Gore challenged the results for 37 days. So why don't they see or acknowledge the different treatment? You know, this is all part of the idea that they're not, in many instances anymore, out to reflect the facts on the ground. They're simply there to put forth a narrative. They're not acting as news as we once knew it or as journalists as we traditionally understood them to be. They're simply trying to forward certain political or corporate interests. So from that standpoint, they're succeeding quite well when they make sure they put forth a narrative. But you use your cognitive dissonance when you watch the news and you say, as you do, just did, this doesn't make sense. I call it the substitution game. When you know that but for the name being changed to a different party, something would be handled entirely differently, you know that there's a narrative at play or there's somebody trying to manipulate an outcome or public opinion. And I like to ask the question when it comes to the election, how would it have been covered if not for the narrative? How would this have been covered if journalists had, had approached this from a neutral standpoint? And I think you have a whole different landscape if that had been the case, both building up to this election and what's happened since. You also have an entire chapter on the Russia investigation. You mentioned that not only did it reveal a massive FBI scandal, but also a massive media scandal because what the media claimed over two years was completely false. Why were there no media corrections or apologies to Donald Trump, at least, as you point out, to Carter Page or the American people? Without that, many Americans still believe the narrative that the president and others were involved in colluding with the Russians. One of the biggest scandals of our time, how the news media has changed and redefined what it means to be a journalist so that they could weaponize their efforts against the president that they decided they didn't like or who was an outsider and not in with the proper money and political interest that they wanted him to be in with. And the media just threw out basically longstanding ethics rules and guidelines and even proudly said that we were doing it and said it was to address a uniquely dangerous president. I argue that there is never a more important time to follow our guidelines and standards. That's why they exist than when we perhaps don't like the subject of our reporting. Otherwise, we don't really need them. We need them to make sure our behavior is consistent and our reporting is accurate, even when we have an emotional feeling about somebody we're reporting on. Instead, all of this wild misreporting based on you know, innuendo, things that would never have been reported, anonymous sources, wrong sources, things that wouldn't have been done 10, 15 years ago. A lot of people would have been fired if this had happened. And there were not these mass, as you said, apologies and firings because, I argue, this was all mission accomplished on their part. They were not trying to disseminate the actual facts. They were trying to create this air of controversy and chaos for the couple of years that they did. And when it didn't turn out to be true in the end, as perhaps some of them knew all along, they still had accomplished their goal, in my view. It seems the journalism schools are okay with advocacy now. So what do we do? Is it already too late? I think people need to not accept it, continue speaking out about it and understand that when they're trying to make you think that you're the only one who has some crazy view and you're not supposed to think it, you're not supposed to believe that scientific study, whatever it is, know that that's not true. Don't live inside this box. They only win the propagandists if you live your life inside the box that I call the internet and social media and the news. Make sure you have this reality check, listen to your cognitive dissonance, listen to your friends and neighbors, and live in the world as it exists, not the one they're trying to create, not this artificial reality. Okay, the book is Slanted, 
How the News Media Taught Us to Love Censorship and Hate Journalism. Thanks for being with us, Cheryl. I appreciate you having me.